to the Mount Rushmore of underground rock. Our guest today, the heavy psych trio out of Rochester, New York, King Buffalo. Sit back, relax, and prepare yourself for a deep dive. King Buffalo, are you receiving me? Yes, sir, we are here. Yes, all here. <laughs> Awesome. Mm -hmm. And they are comprised of Sean. That's Sean McVeigh. That's on, Sean McVeigh, yeah. He's on vocals, lead guitar, and synth. We've also got Dan Reynolds with us today, and he's on bass and synth. And last but not least, we have Scott Donaldson on drums. The first question I'd like to ask you guys is uh, the styling of the music, your obviously your inspirations um, go back to 70s, uh, psych and hard rock. It's very expansive. It's, it has a broad umbrella. Uh, I hear all kinds of different bands, but I also hear uniquely you. Well, I mean, we I know for myself, like, kind of just grew up listening to, like you mentioned, all the sort of 70s, you know, psychedelic hard rock sort of stuff, you know, your Sabbath, Floyd, Zeppelin, Hendrix, all that stuff. Uh, but I also grew up in the, you know, 90s and early 2000s, so there was a lot of, you know, like Rage Against the Machine, System of a Down, all that sort of stuff, like the guitar music of the day. And uh, that's what shaped me sort of as a guitar player. And then, uh, I don't know, I think, I know we're all slightly, have slightly different, and now we listen to different stuff and have different influences, but when we get together, we kind of just, we kind of just play. We don't really try to think like, oh, let's try to sound like, you know, X for this song, you know? Jam-oriented writing? For the most part. Uh, we tweaked it a little bit for this latest EP. Um, but yeah, I would say historically, definitely just been, you know, we write through jamming majority uh collaborative efforts yeah absolutely yeah um your lyrical content you sing about all kinds of cool stuff where where do you pick up these lyrics um and your lyrical content what is driving you to write these type of lyrics uh i mean i guess like the i would assume i would assume pretty much the case with most like lyricists and singers is just kind of either stuff going on in my personal life or in the world or whatever and then i don't know i like to try to paint sort of like an ambiguous sort of uh, picture with it. I don't, I don't want to be too on the nose with anything uh, so where people can interpret things, you know, to their own, in their own way, you know, apply it to their own lives and their own situations. Absolutely. Would, would you guys like to expand on that? Scott and Dan? I mean, I would love to, but I don't really write any lyrics whatsoever. So uh, <laughs> but I would like to, you know, I think Sean does, a, and, and Scott a little bit uh, helps as well, does a good job of creating like I said, ambiguous feeling for it, so it's not, you know, specific to any one person, and we get a lot of people coming up and saying, like, oh, is this about this? And it's like, hey, if it is to you, you know, that's great. If it's meaningful to you in some way, then that's, you know, magnificent. And I think that's important to hook as many people as possible. Yeah, I think I think Sean kind of does the, the broad brushstrokes in a lot of way, like creating a, an outline of a cohesive thing. And then if he gets stuck, basically, we'll kind of like smash our heads together and see what we can come up with and kind of bounce some ideas off each other. But, um, I mean, definitely, it's starting from Sean's vision. Right. And, and so many, um, if you want to coin them, genres, you manage to meld these genres so well together. Um, you know, I hear industrial stuff, especially on your new album, a lot of experimental stuff. You create these layers, almost a stacking type of feel. You use a lot of uh, effects. Um, say delay and reverb, po possibly overdrive. Definitely, I've definitely heard fuzz. Did this build over time, or were you always into the stacking and creating of a um, kind of a, a sonic field? Were you always into this layering and the stacking process, or was it something that slowly kind of evolved over your time? Well, I think definitely as a band, we've always been into, like, you know, since we've all been playing together, that's definitely always been an important part. You know, we. W we don't have a lot of members, so we, we just try to make the sound as big as possible for what, what the three of us are able to do. And I like to try to take a lot of like sort of really simple phrases and use either different you know effect layering or slight variations off that very simple phrase to sort of build songs from there, sort of like the old sort of kraut rock technique, I guess, yeah. or like you know minimalism sort of stuff. Speaking of that, your vocals, I feel as if your vocals are actually a, an additional layer or maybe an actual additional person in the band. You add vocal, uh, a doubling of your vocals and things like that. I find it um, interesting. Do you look at it the same way? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't consider myself like a, like a 
a virtuosic singer by any stretch of the imagination. And so, so you know, it's got to throw all the effects and doubling and all that stuff to uh, make it interesting. And I don't know, I always like to try to sort of sound like a, like on the records, it's kind of like a narrator with, with the vocals, not as opposed to sort of like a first person point of view. Uh, if that makes sense, sort of like, um, but I think maybe you get the idea. I do. I do. Uh, Playful, Playful kind of said the same thing. He always wanted to be, like all the singers he dealt with, he never really liked them, and he always wanted to be more of a narration kind of thing. And I think that kind of came from our writing style in the beginning, um, especially because we started with like a lot of jamming, and like lately Sean's been bringing like some really cool ideas, and then we kind of expand off of that. By starting from the jamming, we're starting very much from a musical standpoint. So we basically play things until they feel interesting, and then like you're saying, the, the vocals are an extra layer. And I feel like they, they really define the songs and add so much, but uh, where they actually start at their core is it's just like music. Yeah, they're definitely always the last thing added. Um, it's very rare for us that the, the, the you know vocals are the first you know thing for the song. It's always usually, almost always the, if the instrumental bed isn't right, you know we keep working on that and then the vocals come after. Interesting. Have you ever written a song with vocals in mind? A little bit more lately, um, sort of Dead Star, the last song on the new EP was that way, and same thing with Echo of a Waning Star uh, on this EP. But for the most part, it's, it's you know, like I said, it's, it's a lot of jamming. Maybe while we're jamming, I'll mumble or hum something into a microphone, but it's usually, it's definitely almost always the, it's like the very last thing we do. Yeah, it has, some of your stuff has it. And also... Your transitions are some of the most frightening in, in a very good way for me. Uh, once it seems that you get settled in, it, you just is there an interest in just shocking someone I into a new feel, like right from, uh, say, um, a, so let's just say a 4-4 four, four beat into something really hard or something very ethereal into something very driving? Are you, uh, does that excite you to um, kind of shake people up like that? Are you aware that you do that in, in some of your transitions? I mean, absolutely. That's definitely, you know, we've always wanted to use a lot of dynamics. You know, being super loud all the time isn't loud anymore. It's just all the same. So you got, we like to go from, you know, soft to hard and, you know, try to keep things interesting and jarring uh, to try to keep, you know, set people up for surprise. Right off the bat, your most recent, I would say, uh, your shocking transitions would be in Red Star 1 and 2. Your transition from Red Star 1 to 2, it's its incredible. its I wouldn't say it's as jarring, but in a way it's very unexpected. But once you get into it, its it, that was the song that I mentioned I felt had a real industrial feel to it because it's very driving. You're pushing us in the direction that you want us to go with this, and, and I think it's really cool. I, um, Transition-wise, I think it's very interesting what you guys do as far as that's concerned. When you do these transitions, are these songs separate? Do you just say, we have two songs, they're t uh, it's kind of similar, but how do we get these two to live together? It depends on the song. Uh, for Red Star, it was when we were first, you know, jamming, that was all, like, like we were saying before, we were writing it as a big, long jam, and then in one of the like sort of practice sessions we went to that fast part but didn't really know where to go from there like it wasn't a, a song it was just you know that whatever 16 bars of the of double time there like oh that that could be cool um we'll have to figure that out and we worked on the first part for a while and then we kind of flushed out a structure for part two and had them live together but for like Ida Karine we had that part and you know the first half is just sort of in five it's fast and jarring and staccato and weird uh and in the course of i was sort of monkeying around with the structure at home and just kind of noodling around on my guitar and then i just kind of stumbled across that riff for the second half and i was like huh i wonder if we can get from that to that you know the first part to the second part and um make it interesting and cool and kind of tweak mess around with it a little bit and um and decided to run with it. That's the song. Yeah, it works out for, it really well. If it's a formula, you, you have a very awesome formula. It seems to work out well. Um, even if it doesn't, I'm... Scott! That's my name. All right. I wanted to talk to you for a moment about vinyl. 
Well, we could talk about this collectively. You release all of your albums on vinyl. Is is this a preference? Is vinyl a preference for you? Are are you guys vintage? Have you always wanted to have your stuff on vinyl? What is the deal with your vinyl as opposed to digital? What do you prefer, vinyl or digital? Well, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you. Yeah, basically, I think when we all started in this band, we were all from the outset, like, we wanted to have our name on vinyl. I know that it's, like, always been kind of a bucket list thing for me, and now I'm trying to raise the bucket list to get my name on more vinyls. But, um, yeah, I know we're all collectors. We all collect it. Dan's got quite the collection. I've got a pretty decent one, and I know Dan's got some as well. But I think especially our fan base, it's something that's really come back, and our fans buy vinyl. It's just something we kind of don't want to not have anymore. So with every release, we kind of plan to put it, to press it to wax and to have it available. Yeah, I mean, it's a, a beautiful era as far as that goes for uh, independent bands, I guess. I mean, people want vinyl now, and they'll pay money for it. And, uh, and I love pressing it, you know, with all the different colored vinyl, all the different treatments. You get to have your artwork nice and big. It's just a beautiful thing for for bands and for fans and everybody else uh, to have physical media once again in their life because I mean, digital is great. It's convenient as far as like the difference in sound goes. I personally don't care all that much, honestly, but the feel of a physical vinyl record is, is a special thing, and, and I love that uh, people are out there uh, jonesing for it now. Yeah, yeah, it's such a great thing. Uh, I, I love the renaissance. It's, I don't like the pricing so much in vinyl nowadays, but... Um... <laughs> I do sure. love that it's back, and it's back with inventions and outselling CDs for the most part, which is interesting. Oh yeah, we definitely sell more vinyl than CDs. I want to say, Scott yeah, so for sure. It's, it's probably six to one ratio. Yeah. Wow. Your your recording processes are interesting. Do you, do you go to uh, studios? Uh, do you do traditional? Do you go to a studio? Do you pay someone to record your stuff? Well, what are some of your recording processes? Let's let's focus. On your newest album, Dead Star, I, I know you. Are you calling it an EP or are you calling it an album? Because maybe in standard album terms, it it may not have ten tracks, but time wise, you've got what's considered an album, in my opinion. Uh, well, I'd say I mean we're treating it more like an EP, but that's just because we, you know, we're on a we're not on a label or anything. We don't have the the PR budget to really push it as an LP. So it's kind of it's all it started as an EP. It was originally just going to be like 20, 25 minutes, and then it kind of just kept growing, and so we'll just still call it an EP. Um, <laughs> but, as, but as far as the recording process goes, that uh, has been pretty similar for all of our records. We track everything in our rehearsal space slash studio, um, and for the most part, uh, so for the latest record, you know, I did... I was the recording engineer, and then we sent it off to our uh, our front of house uh, sound engineer Grant Hustleman to do the mix. And then once he had done the mixing, we sent it to the guy who's mastered all of our records. His name is Bernie Matthews, and uh, he did the mastering. Do you do all your recording yourself? Yeah, um, for the most part. Um, the record before Dead Star, uh, Longing to Be the Mountain, we brought. Um, our, our sound guy Grant again. He he came up and handled uh, most of the recording uh, engineering stuff, so that I could kind of take a step back and sort of co-produce and work on arrangement stuff with our producer Ben McLeod uh, for that record. Um, but then I mixed "Longing to Be the Mountain," and then pretty much everything else I recorded and mixed and everything. And at this point, you have what we'll just coin three albums full length we'll just call them full lengths just for the hell of it and two eps is there a split you're also involved in a split yeah we did a split about what six years ago i think at this point um with oh, yeah. on stv records um with a band from sweden called la betre i yeah. think that's how you say it i, yeah, I, I do not believe yeah i believe they are defunct now but yeah yeah that was a long time ago and also uh, an album of covers that you took? Uh, that, that you no, were... no, we just contributed one song to it. We were on that uh, Electric Ladyland Redux. Um, we did one song. We did The House is Burning Down. But every song was by a different artist. Speaking uh, to Dead Star, uh, and your vinyl in particular, um, you, what I notice on your 
on your pages, you have uh, Dead Star Standard, what you're calling a standard LP in white. Will there be a deluxe or an expanded variant of this album? Uh, we already actually released the deluxe um, in pre-order, and it sold out in an hour. Ah, well. And then we also did test presses, which sold out in like two minutes. Um, I always I always try to make sure we have a few different versions. Like the deluxe, like came with an insert, um, also including some audio commentary where we talked about the tracks. And it was like a really cool um, A side B side opaque press, uh, black and white. Um, the standard is uh, basically a bone white vinyl, doesn't include the insert. And the deluxes were hand numbered. Um, yeah, we tried to like with each release, we tried to do you know something more collectory. Because vinyl is very uh, definitely a collector's market, um, and you know, making pretty cool things is kind of what we should be doing. I agree. Uh, I think your longing to be the mountain LP is really interesting looking with the green and the, the second press. I'm speaking of the green oh, and the uh, galaxy edition. Oh my! Yeah, that's that's a new um, pressing method that they just uh, kind of whipped up at the plant. Basically, they uh, press the black and green together, but you can only see it if you actually put a light behind it. So it actually looks black if it's just sitting on your turntable. Yeah, wow. So it's, yeah, it's a really cool uh, feature that they added. And that, uh, all the artwork on that record was done by uh, our friend uh, Adrian Dexter. It's like his, all, all of his album artwork is phenomenal. Are you, um, are you contracting multiple artists? Who, do you have one artist that, that's done all the artwork on all your albums? Uh, it's, it's multiple. Uh, Adrian did um, Longing to Be the Mountain. Dan actually did the artwork in Orion um, and our demo. Um, Dead Star was done by Ryan T. Hancock. He's uh, an artist from the UK. And then um, uh, Repeater was done by a local artist in Rochester, uh, Mike Trzansky. Uh, I wanted to talk about one of your songs from Dead Star. Uh, the song Ecliptic? Do you, yeah. Do you like John Carpenter is my first question. <laughs> oh, absolutely, of course, yeah. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> I'm a huge... Oh, what are you talking about? What? I'm a John who? <laughs> I'm a huge John Carpenter fan, and when I heard this song, I couldn't believe it. I said, they had to be sitting there watching Escape from New York or <laughs> the taking of Pelham 123 or something. That They had to be motivated by John Carpenter. Tell, tell us about that song and, and how that came to be. It's so interesting. Um... Actually, it came to be because we were kicking around the idea of making the record, making the EP a full length, um, and I was like, well, hey, I have this uh, synth idea that, you know, I could flesh out and we could make it a song and, you know, add a little more time to get it up to full length status, um, and then you're like, okay, well, the guy said, yeah, okay, let's give it a shot. And then as we were still continuing to think about it, we were like, well, we should still call it an EP, but hearing it in context with the rest of the record, it sounded really cool, and so we just left it in. <laughs> That's basically that. <laughs> your contributions to your prior albums and how, uh, how, how diverse um, the genres of music that you explore are, I think it worked out perfect. I don't, th I don't think you broke from any traditions as far as that's concerned. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm glad you dig it. It was, I don't know, it was really fun. I, I, it's one of my favorite tracks on the on the record, um, but that's because I listen to John Carpenter music like all the time in my personal life and love that sort of thing. So it was pretty cool to get to bring that um, to the band. Does anyone else have a love for John Carpenter? And have any of you seen John Carpenter live? Because he's been touring lately. Not lately, lately, but last year. He was on tour while we were on tour, so we we missed it, unfortunately. Oh. Yeah, I never have. And of course, yeah, I think uh, both the uh, movies and music. Uh, yeah, he's a great man for the most. Yeah, I think Escape, you know, Escape from New York or, or L.A. gets referenced, like, at least at 50% of our band practices in some form. And uh, Dan, uh, you play synth as well. Did you add anything on that track? Nope, no. Sean did uh, all that amazing wonderfulness uh, on his own. You know, some of your music has a real Middle Eastern flavor to it, almost a mantra-esque type of thing. What's your, what's your take on this? Uh, I mean, for me, I, I definitely, like, I, I wouldn't call myself, like, uh, a connoisseur. Yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't know much, but I, I know, like, I, I hear different things from all over the world that I like, 
Um, and I definitely, for a lot of the music, like I was saying before, I like to try to sort of sound like a narrator and almost have it be sort of like, uh, like you said, like a mantra um, or, you know, sort of like um, a chant type feel to it. So, and, you know, it just kind of lends itself to a lot of those scales and, and techniques. Yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot of our music, well, yes, a lot of it's almost meditative, at least. Mm-hmm. Certain sections and, and, and portions of it, um, and so definitely that sort of portion of the world's uh, musical style lends itself well, for sure. Agreed, agreed. Your new album, Dead Star, just released March 20th. How's it been received so far? Good. We got a lot of good feedback on it. I was pretty nervous going in that you know we took a lot of chances and swings and tried a lot of weird stuff but it seems to be getting pretty good feedback so i don't know scott but might he handled the social media so he probably has seen more than we have. how many comments did you delete scott uh well i mean i i have bots everywhere so everything has been <laughs> okay <fun>. good <laughs> but um no like it's yeah i think we're all a little nervous especially in the early stages of deciding whether it's going to be an ep or a full length because um, we're, you know, it's, it's different. We, we definitely got, uh, like, more experimental and weird with it. Um, but, yeah, it's been extremely well received. Um, I wish, you know, the, a, a pandemic wasn't happening, you know, while we release a record, but that's not nothing we can really do about it, you know. Yeah. It's just the current climate. Um, but, yeah, we're, we've been getting a lot of great reviews. Um, everybody seems to love it. And good. <laughs> it would be really bad if they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you guys have toured extensively. Uh, do you have any standout moments of any of your tours? Because you've been overseas, you've been, um, you played Rock Lost, which I thought was really cool. Uh, some shows in Oslo and, and other places. Any standout moments touring? And any best moments? Any worst moments? And you can all answer this if you want. <laughs> My favorite was when we played uh, Buxta Festival in uh, Tromsø, Norway, which is like I think it was like in the Arctic Circle. It was like right on the water. It was really incredible. Um, we've managed to play outdoors in the snow, as well as outdoors in like I don't know, like hundred degree heat with no sun. Those kind of sucked. Um, but yeah, I think the best would have to be that uh, that. From so Norway, for me at least. Okay, Dan or Scott? Hmm. Best or worst? So hard to say. I mean, like the the Dunn Jam is almost like the best and the worst uh, show we've ever played, just experience wise, almost like paradoxically. After the fact, it was amazing. During the fact, I felt like I might die uh, since we're playing on a beach in like hundred degree weather in the sun. Uh, but it was a wonderful, weird festival for only a select a group of individuals and uh and it was a crazy time for sure i'll definitely remember that forever and ever yeah that's uh that one was definitely probably one of the hottest um just like sweat rolling into the eyes midway through the first song and you know of course covered yourself in all the sunscreen you could because you're underneath like the summer italian sun mm. um but uh yeah Book the festival was amazing too like they fed us whale and you're just like staring into the mountains and so close to the arctic circle and the sun never really goes down it's just like constant daylight and we can kind of say that we you know played played a festival with alice cooper which is you know i'm, I'm a big alice cooper fan so that was really cool freak Valley. oh yeah he had one the next day yeah yeah they're like loading in his like wardrobe cases as we're leaving of course um <laughs> but uh yeah uh Freak Valley was amazing too. Um, just like a really good vibe, and that's where they shot the Rocket Blast video. Uh, very professionally run, and um, just got to hang out with some really cool people that we don't always get to see. Um, that's the cool thing about festivals is that you get to hang out with a lot of bands that are normally somewhere else at the same time. So that's always a nice thing. Yeah. How about worst? Does anybody have a worst or a? Uh... Uh, Sean. Sean can tell you all about Oklahoma. Oh man, <laughs> I totally forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, oh man, I don't even. There's, that's a long story. There's a lot to unpack there, but it's just a shit hole. Fucking, can I swear? I'm. I'm. I don't mean. I don't know. I didn't check with you, but that place 
stuck. It was in Oklahoma City, right next to like a one of the sh- crappiest used car lots I've ever seen, and like the bouncer was telling us how he like burned a guy's house down. Uh, it was just you know showing off his gun, and it's just like okay, this is an uncomfortable place to be. I will say that. Um... We were supposed to get a certain deposit before we showed up. We got a portion of that, and then when we did pull up, uh, we were he was attempting to pay us in like precious gems and CDs and. That was a different Oklahoma show. Yeah, you guys, show. Are, you guys are talking about, about different Oklahoma, Oklahoma shows. Oh, I'm talking about I'm talking about. That was uh, Tulsa, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah you're talking about Tulsa. Tulsa. I was talking Oklahoma City, which Tulsa uh, Tulsa was pretty terrible as well. But that was different. That that had nothing to do with weird political climate or guns. Um, yeah, but that one, that's the one where um, the local band wanted to fight us because yeah. the promoter, promoter gave us all the same time slots. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, he promised to, like, every band that every band would play Saturday at 10 p.m. Uh, it was a disaster. Yeah, that's a dick move. I don't think he does that anymore. I don't think he is in the music business anymore. He was clearly a guy in way over his head. Like, nice enough guy, but totally just I had no clue what it took to run a festival yeah the uh so we got there on a saturday and uh the sound guy didn't show up it was it was like all at, at like a at a club the sound guy quit midway through friday because it was such a shit show um and uh so there was no sound guy so the oh i don't know i don't know what the what the rules the rules are uh, we'll try to watch the profane language. Uh, but, yeah, the sound guy quit. Um, so there was no sound guy for the whole day on Saturday. Uh, it was just a disaster. Let's, let's talk about Red Star again for a minute and your new video for Red Star Part 2. Pretty cool. How was this made? Did you guys make this yourself, or did you have some professionally help you with it? We had a guy, a local guy who was a pro. His name is Adam Antelek, uh, and he's great, and he. Yeah, it was kind of, he just made it happen. Yeah, it's a real neat, uh, the, the idea is cool. Who, who came up with the uh, the idea for the video? Uh, me and Adam were, like, kind of brainstorming some ideas, and then Sean, um, like, had some more ideas. So, basically, I would say the three of us kind of throwing things together. Um, just, uh, you know, wanted to work with, like, green screens and do some weird stuff in the background. And then we also had access to a haunted house. So... When you see, like, you know, mannequins and weird black light stuff happening, that's where all that stuff is taking place. Oh, cool. Rochester, New York, that's where you guys are from. What, what's your local scene? What was your local music scene like as you were growing up? And what is it like now, comparatively? I mean, when I first started in bands back in 2003 or four, I guess, uh, I recall there being a lot of like underground sort of punk, gross, hardcore stuff. And then when I started actually playing out, there was a lot of stoner, like sleep sort of worship stuff um, for a while. And I was in a band that you know, dabbled in the just be way too loud all the time sort of mentality. Um, so there was that. And what there is now, uh, I, I don't know. I, I would be required to go to shows more often, but. I'm pretty hermed it up these days, which, well, especially now, but... Um, yeah, it's, 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 hard, cool. it's hard, like, as far as currently, like, there's a lot of great talent, and we have a lot of friends that have really good projects, but it's tough to, like, be in the scene a lot, because we're on the road so much, um, and then it's, you know, when you're on the road for a month, sort of the last thing you want to do is go to another, like, rock club, dirty rock club, and see another loud show. It's kind of like, a, you, you kind of need to decompress. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I mean, as far as, like, there's a lot of great bands right now. Uh, excuse me. May, Maybird's kind of half Rochester, half New York. Um, Animon. Uh, Fuzz Rod's a great local band. Overhand Sam's out of Rochester. There's, there's definitely a lot of good stuff. Um, it's all sort of different. I don't know if there isn't a huge sort of psychedelic stoner like scene right now. Um, but there's a lot of sort of all sorts of different stuff. Your your set list. Let's talk about your set list. Do you tend to set up a set list and play strictly off of that set list, or do you like to mix it up in, in relation to the duration of a tour? Does, does um, it evolve? We we I mean 
for like a specific tour, we'll probably have a, a couple different sort of blueprints um, for a set list, but we do try to like vary things up from night to night, you know, so if, if there are people that somehow want to come to more than one show, they're not getting the same exact show every time, but at the same time, we're not totally willy nilly because, you know, certain things do flow better into others. And, you know, um, so it's, Hey, we can put this, these three songs together in one big block, you know, so it's, it's nice to be able to do stuff like that to sort of make like the best sort of listening experience. Um, while also trying to, have little changes different from night to night so that people can find something new uh, to enjoy. Interesting. Your music really lends itself to a live environment. Live is really big. I really think certain bands shine live. Have you ever considered doing a full live album? I'm sure at some point we will, yeah. Um, it's a matter of, you know, there's a lot of different things that go into making a live record. You know, you got to have the right venue, obviously all the gear and everything. So it's not, it's, it's not so easy. We do, right now we record all, all of our shows, pretty much all of our shows, um, and do sort of like a bootleg thing, you know, sort of, sort of for free on our website. You can go and um, look up a show, look at the shows that are there and, and download it for free. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's basically a, it's pretty low quality most of the time. It's not, you know, it's not going to sound like a record. It's going to sound like, a, you know, like a show bootleg. Hopefully we can look forward to that in the future. Yeah, for sure. I mean, we're at a level now where it would certainly be easier to sort of know the venue will sound good. So know the venue will be packed full of people. So it's not in front of a, you know, empty house. So you get some good crowd noise. So the energy's there. Um, so it's definitely easier now, especially we got our own sound guy and all that sort of stuff. So it's definitely, I don't know, obviously not guaranteeing anything, but it, it definitely be more in the works now than ever been uh, in the past, for sure. It makes sense. It makes sense. You know, some of your contemporaries, like uh, let's say Cadaver, Earthless, uh, My Sleeping Karma. Are you aware of these bands? What do you think about these bands? Yeah, I mean they're they're sort of the the I mean especially Earthless. They're sort of like the the godfathers of I guess what we do in a way, you know, like they're sort of the kings of the castle. Amazing players. They've been doing it for a long time and they're awesome. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. Uh, I know I, um, our friends are really good friends with Cadaver because um, they've toured with them a couple times and they kind of bailed them out when they couldn't get any of their gear in Europe. Um, and actually, uh, Mate, the basis of My Sleeping Karma, is the head of our booking company in Europe now. He runs Sound of Liberation. So I'm, I'd am i say we're pretty familiar with all three of those bands. Like, are we, like, close with them on a personal level? Not really, because I, I don't think we just we just haven't happened to play with each other enough. But, yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely aware of them. In our current state, a lot of bands are doing live streams. As a matter of fact, Cadaver did a really awesome live stream recently. Is Have you guys considered maybe doing a live stream for your fans? For sure, yeah, yeah. That was like when all this went down. That was like the first thing that we thought of was the live stream, and you know we need something to hold people over because considering we're releasing a record and you know we're not going to be able to tour on it for a couple months. Yeah, we we went through it. Our bandwidth situation in our practice space is not up to snuff. So instead of like trying to attempt something and then just having it break up um, halfway through would be a massive issue. Um, we actually film some stuff and we're going to be release, releasing some live sessions there will be more details on that later we got to lock that stuff down um, we just saw the first cut today but yeah we're we're doing st we're doing what we can um we just don't have the the bandwidth in our in our area uh i'd like to ask you all individually the same question uh you do you have any favorite bands from when you're very young who wants to go first <laughs> Uh, I guess I'll go first. I mean, all that came from my dad, for sure. And so the list would probably be, oh, the Beatles, uh, yes, Genesis, and then throw in some, like, uh, Carly Simon, some Simon and Garfunkel, and maybe some Harry Chapin, just to make it slightly more confusing. But, um, so, yeah, either, like, sort of pretty heavy proggy stuff or singer-songwriter stuff that's a little more... Uh, well, nice, and just listen to it and feel nice about it. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I'll go. Um, yeah, my dad was super big into cock rock, so uh, Def Leppard. Um, like, 
all those like '80s hair metal bands. So, and then I then I realized that he knew some classic rock, and then I dove deeper myself. Um, so I don't know. I, I I guess it's like '80s '80s hair metal bands, and then like the the classic greats. Um, and then I I got super into like a lot of those um, like Alice Cooper. I've always appreciated his like stage show and everything and pageantry and how they wrote their songs. Um, and just, you know, the, all the bands everybody talks about. Sabbath, Floyd, you know, you know, the, you know the list, David Bowie. Excellent. Yeah, for, for me, um, one of the first bands that I can, like, really remember, like, singing along to was Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. It was used to really, you know, grew up with uh, Pink, Pink Floyd was huge for me, Zeppelin and Sabbath and uh, Hendrix. And then as I got a little older, you know, I, I guess I wouldn't say older, um, but, you know, as I was kind of diverging from my parents' taste, you know, I was really into the band Cake, um, really into, I mean, I had my Nirvana phase, which, you know, I don't know any 35-year-old that didn't have a Nirvana, Nirvana phase. Oh, that's uh, me, buddy. Yep, didn't have one. Are, well, are you both 35? I thought you were both 34. Well, okay, uh, fine. I'm 33. Yeah, well, there you go. So my point, my point still stands. Well, my um, girlfriend is 27, I, I, and she's had a Nirvana phase. Right. I don't think age has anything to do with it. I think so I got it does. A year, I got a year to go. I just better start listening. But, yeah, uh, um, and a lot of, you know, the, the grunge stuff of that era, um, I guess that was the stuff that I would say when I was very young that I was really into. Going back to Ecliptic for a second, uh, you know, it just dawned on me, it would make an excellent video. Have you guys considered maybe making a video for that? Kind of an homage uh, to, to, to Carpenter himself, possibly? How much, how uh, much do you want to front for this video? <laughs> <laughs> Videos cost money. I wish, I wish I had all the money in the world. So no. But yes, we would love to. I don't know. But I mean, I mean baby, maybe. Who yeah, who knows? Maybe at some point. It's a matter of, you know, we, there's a lot of other stuff that we want to accomplish maybe before we do that, but uh, it would certainly be a fun project. Your fans, how many of your fans your age do you think would, uh, are you, you getting a lot of this John Carpenter feel from, from other people? Is anybody else asking you if you like John Carpenter, if you've, you've watched Escape from New York or Pelham or any of those movies? I would assume... I mean, I guess we haven't got, gotten a lot of direct feedback on it yet, but I would say it's pretty on the nose, so I, I think I think people probably know. Yeah, and I think <laughs> uh, that style has been coming back a little bit. Oh, yeah, for sure. The last years as well. I mean, you, you hear it from not just us, obviously, but the synths are coming back and people are, are working their way back to that uh, 80s uh, John Carpenter feel for sure, and I'm all, all for it. Any standout moments in the recording of this album, Dead Star? We kind of did this one a little different than usual, so a lot of it was piecemeal. Um, I don't think we tracked anything, all three of us at the same time. There was a moment we tracked, but it, it, yeah. I mean, this one was, um, time was an issue, I guess you can say. Um, all the ideas, you know, there's a lot of cool stuff, but we had to get this off to the presses uh, for the tour that, didn't got canceled. Happy, kind of <laughs> happy about that, but um, so the, it, was, it was a high stress, uh, high energy situation, which probably helped and hindered in, in its own certain ways. But um, so yeah, it was done. Like Sean said, piecemeal. So it felt kind of compartmentalized and a little strange, but obviously it turned out great. Um, and it just helped us to move things along a little more by doing it that uh, that route. Yeah, I would definitely say um, the standout moment for me is like basically we create our own deadlines because we need to have vinyl press like for the tour that basically all the dates got postponed not canceled postponed yep, um, <laughs> yeah, J july and september and august like all those dates have gotten moved to um but yeah i just the the moments i remember is like i think it was uh what was uh at a Carine and like seeing sean's stress levels it's it always I always feel bad for Sean when it comes to recording time because I, I, like we have to set deadlines obviously so vinyl shows up on time, um, and like he was saying earlier, vocals tend to come last. So getting those last um, lyrics, you know, finalized and making sure that you're okay with them and you actually like what you're saying, it's 
it's fun. It's like it's kind of funny because Sean's my friend, but I feel bad at the same time. So I'm like, hey man, anything I can do to help, you know? Uh, it's uh, it's always a stressful time when it's getting down to the wire. And vocals are definitely the most vulnerable of instruments, if you want to call it that. So it's got to be tough. I can't even imagine because that's like that's how you sound from your your face. And so like if people don't like it, that's got to be like the roughest. I don't know. <laughs> Do you work well under pressure? Is that why you set these deadlines? No, we set uh, the deadlines just because we we yeah, needed a we yeah we like you know we got to keep the got to keep the machine moving you know um, and then at, at the time when you set the deadline, I said like oh that seems manageable and then like things start moving and you're like oh my god what did we do? Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was around Christmas and New Year's and you know so family stuff was happening so it, it it became a little dire for a bit there i think on Sean's end. yeah it was just it was just intense but i don't know i wouldn't say i would definitely prefer not to work under pressure like that but i don't know i guess i'll always find something to be stressed out about with every project so and i think it helps i don't know a lot of musicians tend to be the type that enjoy procrastination i don't know if i can say that about all of us but fuck it let's just say it about all of us um <laughs> so the deadlines help i think in a way just to keep the pressure on a little bit uh, but i think there's a better, better middle ground somewhere um just to you know because you can sit and, and tweak a song till you're you know 10 years from now and try to make it perfect in every single way but at a certain point it's just sort of just, just play it man just get it out move it out the door speaking to that is there anything that you've you feel you don't have to speak specifically about a song but is there anything you feel like you put out under pressure and didn't have those 90 years to tweak it and wished you did i am not the one to ask that question <laughs> because Sean's answer is Sean's answer is probably every single everything moment yeah. Of every song. yeah yeah i mean you know as, as the guy who has his hands on so many different facets of it I, yeah like there's there isn't anything we've released that i'm like oh yeah that that's perfect you know, um, I could find something on all of them. I'll go back and listen to old stuff every now and then, and when I hear it, I'm like, oh, yeah, that actually turned out pretty good. Or sometimes I'm like, oh, my God, I can't believe that I put this out, you know. Uh, yeah, I'm definitely not the one to ask that question. <laughs> Typical musician, too hard on yourself. Yeah, for sure. Uh, yeah, and as far as me, of we've all, yeah. Yeah, we've all, we've all had those moments where we're just like, do we suck? Is this Is this the end? Is this, you know, are people just going to stop liking it? And then you, you're going to listen like us in this band, Sean especially, because he's done mixing and engineering as well. Like, we listen to these things more than any other person is ever going to listen to them probably in such a short amount of time. So you're agonizing over every single individual detail, and you just kind of, you know, you start to lose sight of the, the broader picture. So when you're in that environment... Yeah, you're gonna you're gonna kind of lose it a little bit, but then when you can take a step back, like like Sean says, like when you listen to stuff a little bit later, you realize, hey, maybe that wasn't the worst thing ever that you know I ever did. Let's speak about touring again for a second, and this would be another question that you could all answer individually. How would you how do you personally feel touring overseas is compared to touring in the United States? Uh, well, I guess I'll go first. It's definitely a lot different overseas. Um, we've only been to Europe, so I don't know what it would be like in South America or Asia or anything, but it's, yeah, it's definitely a lot different. There seems to be a lot more of, uh, uh, emphasis on hospitality over there as far as just like the logistics of venues and, and promoters and everything, you know, like the, their, uh, the staff is always so much more friendly and excited to have you and, you know, gives you food and is like concerned about your well being and, uh, fans in general are just I think in, our music does a lot better over there than it does in the States you know um, I think rock music in general is just a little more popular and, and, and broad over there uh, or broadly accepted over there um, but with that said you know we still have great tours in the US um, but it's definitely different the US is a lot more like you're, you're, you have to be a lot more self-sufficient I think over here than you do over there um, but I, I don't know maybe that's just our experience yeah there seems to be more of an infrastructure built in for uh, smaller bands i guess in europe uh, i mean they got 
And it's just the rental companies for gear and vans they, uh, seem to be more prolific and, and, and better, and they have uh, more festivals geared towards sort of smaller scale bands, and not the Coachella size sort of thing. Um, and yeah, there, there seems to be more of a hunger towards standard rock, well, not standard, but rock and roll music over there. And I, I don't think that's anybody's fault. Uh, just America's always been pushing, you know, who's the biggest pop artist, who's you know, who's the number one and this and that. And so they always get pushed before everybody else. And then the smaller bands kind of get leveled under them a little bit. So uh, it's harder to get above water in the States um, as a smaller scale band, I think. Yeah, I mean, the rock scene in the U.S. is very much underground. It's, it's pop, pop central. Um, over there, it's not that way. And because of that, um, you know, the audience is bigger. Um, not, not necessarily that the audience isn't big here, it's just it's tougher to get like in those people's ears. Um, but yeah, I think I think starting off especially Europe is easier for us. But now that we're like kind of getting to like a a better level in the states, it's definitely gotten better. I, you know, when we first started out, here's your two drink tickets. Now get on stage. This is how it used to be. You know, ten years ago or whatever, even before we, we were in this band. But now we're getting to a place where it's much more comfortable because we are self-sufficient, like Sean was saying. Sure. But, and that being said, I mean, it's hard to say because, I mean, we were a little spoiled and blessed that our first tour in Europe was opening for Elder, who already had a pretty good foothold over there. So we never had to slum it in Europe. So from that standpoint, I guess we don't really know uh, what it would be like to start from zero there. You know how it is from zero here so um yeah that's true. but tours everywhere are great and uh, the fans are great everywhere and it's high uh and it's weird you just realize how similar things are between country to country uh, as much as they're different you know people sort of stay the same and it's, it's wonderful meeting them all awesome yeah touring overseas it must be trying on a lot of different levels i'd like to speak to uh say house kits this could be something that i could ask you primarily dan or, or uh, scott and then we could uh, filter over and to sean and dan house kits when you're touring in areas where you can't have your kit what are there many downsides to playing on a house kit um i mean of course it's not i mean i'm kind of ocd about my stuff like all my stuff is taped out all tuned a certain way and in like the exact position so I can, you know, play to my sleep. Um, over there, obviously, you, you're, just, you're doing it differently. I mean, Sean and Dan have to deal with different stuff too. Like, yeah, they it might be the same amp, but it's not really ever the same amp. It's got its, all, its own quirks and whatever. Um, but, you know, you just make the best of it. If you, if you don't suck enough, which I like to think that I don't, uh, you, can, you can make it work. Um, and usually, uh, we have like a back line company so I can pick out the kind of kit I want to use and then I'll be touring with that for the majority of the tour unless we're doing like fly-ins and then, then it's usually like a festival and they, most festivals usually have like a really nice back line kit anyway and they give you plenty of time um, the majority of the time to get it how you want it so you're not completely stressed out and losing your mind and afraid while you're playing. Uh, how about Sean and Dan? Um What's it like playing on uh, when you're overseas on on different equipment than you're used to playing on primarily? Yeah, I mean, it, I won't speak for all bass players, but at least in our sort of genre, we're pretty spared of anything too terrible. I mean, if you show up to a backline, you're typically working with an Ampeg 810, which is great, and you usually got some sort of Ampeg head up on top of that. So you know what? we don't usually have to run through too many hoops to get uh, a pretty decent sounding rig. And sometimes what I'm playing through at a venue, specifically festivals, is probably a thousand times better than what I'm bringing on the road anyway. So um, usually it's not an issue for me. And I just don't stress it too much. Yeah, I, for me, I, I, you know, I find like when I'm renting an app to use as backline for a whole tour, I'm more stressed about it than if I show up to a festival and, I'll just use, a lot of times I'll just use whatever they have as the back line of a festival. Um, and, it, cause, and that's kind of exciting, you know, when you're in the moment, like, oh, it's a, it's a one-off, I just got to make this work for this one show. But it's when like, oh, I'm going to 
have something that I'm going to use for a whole tour, then I get a little more uh, sort of anal and nervous about it. Um, and yeah, I mean, even if it's the, you know, I, I haven't found yet that a twin over there sounds like a twin over here, but I don't know. Maybe that's just weird cork snipping. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it is what it is. It's part of the gig. Right. Yeah. Uh, Sean, you mentioned you use a Fender twin and, uh, Dan, you mentioned using eight, uh, 810 amp peg. Um, I, I've been keeping track of you, Scott. I've been seeing you mostly playing, um, Vista lights, correct? Yeah, my, my US kit is my Vista lights. Um, they're great for live sound. Um, and way back in the day when we didn't have a sound guy and we were playing like some smaller stages with basically with barely a PA, it's nice to have those drums. They, they tend to ring out a little bit more so you can actually hear the stuff that I'm doing on the toms. Um, and they look, they look super cool. Like Dan used to do lights back in the day before he started doing synth stuff and didn't have enough hands and fingers to, to handle it. Do you play on an acrylic snare? Do you have a chrome over brass? Do you have a maple snare? What is your snare? The one that I tour with is a brass. It's a Tama Carphonic brass snare. Um, I, like I love that thing. Tama has some really great stuff. I got, I just got their copper one that I've been using a lot of practice, which is really awesome. A lot warmer, um, but still cuts really well. Yeah. What kind of what kind of heads are you using? Um, I've been lately using the the Evans G1 heads. Um, just because you can do you have a little bit more flexibility with the tunings. Um, but for tour, I'll usually go like a two ply head with like a reverse dot, just so super duty, so I'm not just blasting through heads. Right. Your symbol choices are. I saw a little bit of what you were using. You use Piesty? Yeah. Um, I go back and forth with the hats and the rides. Um, giant beat uh, basically crashes, and then I'll do giant beat hats and ride and sometimes we'll switch those for 2002s. The 2002s tend to cut through a little bit better. Um, the giant beats are like more smooth and darker. I've also been really kicking around the idea of getting into Ks because like the Zildjian K symbols are really nice and sound really smooth mm -hmm. but I haven't bit the bullet and wanted to spend the money yet. Um, your kick, your pedal. What, what type of pedal, what brand and type of pedal and what's your batter? choice um all iron cobra stuff for like hardware tama uh it's the 900 series the expensive one because i just um, i just bought the expensive one um and uh i just i always use felt would that be felt on a say a, a polymer head or is it off is it just a giant felt batter um it's just like a it's like felt with that's the it's like the standard one that comes with the tom i don't really do anything too crazy with that it's the uh, felt that attaches and then the head is just um, usually a super kick too. Um, I wanted to start messing with the hydraulic heads but I haven't gotten into that yet. Oh, so you're using an Aquarian head for your kick? Yeah, I, in my experience those are the ones that always seem to sound the best mm -hmm. uh, for, my tuning, for my tuning style so that's, that's what I go to. Beautiful. They're, they are perfect. I, I love them. I uh, how about sticks? Um, I'm, I'm Vic first right now. Um, 5B's I'll go between nylon and wood tip. Okay. You tend to use nylon more live? Uh, I tend to use nylon more live just because they last longer because I don't break the tips off. Okay. So it's not it's about projection pretty much, line. Yeah, I don't, it, I don't really care. I mean, there's a slight difference in sound of cymbal. I think Sean cares more about my cymbals with the nylon tips for recording than, than live stuff. Oh, so do you play more when you record with nylon? Uh, I know, I think, what was, it, was it for ETA, Sean, that you wanted me to do it with the wood because it was, like, sounding weird or something? I can't remember. I think it depends on the song. Um, sometimes if we need a lot of that, because it's really, it's, it's really only the ride symbol that you'll, anyone will ever hear a difference with nylon versus wood. And so sometimes if we really need a little more uh, presence in the ride symbol, we'll have them flip over to the nylon. Uh, if we want a little more of a subdued, We'll use the wood. So a mix. Okay. Sean, I've seen you play a Strat. I'm not a guitar player. I've seen you play another guitar primarily with, would you like to talk about your setup? Some of your sure. effects pedals, because I, I know for sure you use a delay and a reverb and overdrive, but would you like to expand on some of your equipment? Sure. The uh, guitar is a Hagstrom D2F. Um, it's 
since been retrofitted with all sorts of, you know, different pickups, Seymour Duncan 59s, all new hardware and everything on it. And that's my main guitar that I have been using 95% of the time. And uh, like I said before, the amp's a twin. Uh, it's had a few modifications to it, but nothing too crazy. Uh, just modifications to make it a little more uh, lower lower wattage um, so that it can run it a little bit quieter uh, to help it get a little more sweet spot sooner so that I'm not deafening every everybody at every venue in small clubs. Um, pedal board, um, got a lot of stuff on it, I guess, but it's also pretty pretty minimal and manageable. Um, every standard Vox uh, 847 uh, watt pedal. I recently started using a new fuzz pedal. For years, I used a uh, fuzz face clone that I built off of uh, Build Your Own Clones website. But I just switched to a uh, fuzz by a company called Stomp Underfoot. Um, it's a prototype of the, I think it's called the Lascatola Nera. Um, and it's sort of like a big muff on one side, and then it also has an octave circuit. So I, bre- I recently been messing around with that. Um, overdrive pedals uh, used mostly Lightning Boy Audio overdrive pedals. They have a, a, a pedal called the Soul Drive 5, um, which has a 12 AX7 in it, and it's a really cool sort of natural overdrive. Um, but I've been sort of bouncing around with a few different ones lately, just experimenting. Um, I use a, a Whirlwind uh, Phase 90, Phaser, uh, Strymon Timeline Delay, and a TC Electronics Hall of Fame Reverb for my reverb. Interesting. You've been using that Strymon for a long time. A few years now, yeah. Uh, since, I guess, about two years. Okay. Dan, how about you? What's your setup, bud? Hmm. Well, uh, I've been using the same bass practically my whole musical career. It's a music band Sterling from uh, early 2000s. Um, and actually, it's always I use these days is a 410 uh, Avatar cab because I don't want to move an 810 ever if I don't have to in the rest <laughs> of my lifetime. Um, uh, and then recently, I bought a Bergantino uh, D Class uh, Solid State bass amp, six pounds. It's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> it's in my case with my pedal board and my synth and my synth pedals, uh, and it saves me a lot of stress. Uh, for cane heavy stuff, um, but what I do is uh, I similarly use some Lightning Boy audio stuff to sort of sweeten up the tone through the amp because it's super clean, um, very digital. So I have a Lightning Boy uh, New Vision pedal, which has uh, some vacuum tubes uh, built inside of it, and then I recently got another uh, little toy from them, which is just a little passive uh, passive pedal to run at the end of the chain just to add some. Uh, Oh, sort of analog, uh, old world sort of sound to it. Um, and then I have, you know, the uh, Green Rhino uh, Overdrive. I have a, a company out of Philadelphia called uh, Team Awesome. It's the uh, way, uh, what the heck is it called? I don't even know. I bought it so long ago. Um, but anyway, it's a fuzz pedal uh, with a nice noise gate and a dry clean knob on it. Um, and then just uh, basically a Phase 90 uh, and a Watt pedal. Um, which I use just to make real dumb noise with. Um, but it's pretty basic these days, cut it down um, quite a bit from years past, both amps and cabs and pedals, um, just to streamline, because now we got all the synths to fill in the gaps um, where weird uh, bass and guitar noises used to go. I saw an interview with you um, on your rig, and you mentioned the brown note. <laughs> yeah. Would you like to expand on the brown note, please? <laughs> I mean, it's just kind of fun. There's a couple points. I mean, it's just fun to run uh, the fuzz into the distortion and then throw the wah pedal at the very end of the chain um, just so you get a really dumb, gnarly, overdriven wah sound, which is just almost implausibly unusable in terms of, like, musical context for the most part, but... In, in terms of like texture and uh, using it to just sort of create a moment, it's uh, super fun. Well, I guess that brings me to ask, what does the future have in store for Buffalo? Are you currently writing something? I know 
You just had an album come out. Are you writing currently? Um, I mean, we're we're not currently writing, but we do have it. I mean, now that we're home for the foreseeable future, um, we'll probably start working on some stuff here, uh, but no official timetable for release or anything like that. Is there anything I missed? Is there anything you'd like to talk about? Would you like to tell us where we can find your music and other things King Buffalo related? Uh, our website, kingbuffalo.com. If you're buying any physical merch, kingbuffalo.bigcartel.com. And then if you want, you know, we're on all streaming platforms. And then if, you know, people sometimes still use Bandcamp, so uh, kingbuffalo.bandcamp. Okay. We're obviously in a strange time right now with the virus. You've obviously lost some shows later on say summertime fall any hopes of making up any of those shows or anything lined up in the fall so you don't have to worry about canceling as of yet yeah we've only had to cancel a handful um all the other ones have already been postponed and i think boston minneapolis milwaukee and hamden connecticut all just got announced today so yeah i think i think pretty much all our postponements have already been sent out so yeah we're we're pretty good right now anything on your mind you'd like to talk about uh, yeah, I don't. I think I think we covered a lot. Well, King Buffalo, I'd like to thank you very much for coming on the show and talking. It's it's really great to understand where it is you've come from, what's prompted you to come up with this awesome music. Uh, I hope you keep putting out this awesome music, and I wish all of you the absolute best in your musical endeavors in the future.